Welcome to the Mental Health Professionals Network webinar for this evening, which is working together to support the mental health of people who've experienced family violence. Um, we're delighted to, to let you know that there have been over 2,000 people register to participate in this, which I think is just an indicator of um, how important this topic is. And we've got a, a really expert and um, lively and interesting panel tonight, so it's going to be a, a very useful discussion for you. So far online there are 558 people, so welcome. Um, I'm Mary Emelaeus, I'm a GP and psychotherapist based in Cairns in North Queensland where it's about 30 degrees. And we're thinking of you in the rest of Queensland and the Northern Territory with cyclones bearing down on you or rain from the post cyclone period. Um, so I work at um, Headspace with young people and I have been doing that for seven or eight years and I've facilitated a number of mental health professionals network webinars. So I'd like to um, welcome our panellists for this evening. So you've already had the uh, biographies of the panellists so you um, know a little bit about who they are. So first of all I'd like to introduce Kelsey Hegarty. So Kelsey's a GP and an academic from Victoria. Um, hi Kelsey, welcome. Hi, hi everybody. Now you've developed a measure of domestic violence um, which is called the Composite Abuse Scale and it's the first validated multidimensional measure of partner abuse, I understand. So could you just... Yes, that was for my PhD. It was particularly to include emotional abuse and harassment, yes. So thank you very much. It's great to have you on our panel. Um, I'd like to welcome Carmel. So Carmel's a psychologist also from Victoria. Um, Carmel, I was just wondering what, what first um, brought your interest in family violence? Uh, well, I think that um, I started thinking about it in child, my child protection days because I so often was working with women who are impacted by violence and um, I have a fascination with the whole recovery process for women and children after family violence. So, thanks very much, Carmel. Sorry, I understand that people might be having a little trouble hearing me so I'm also reading some instructions as I'm talking to you. Um, so, uh, Jack, you're from South Australia. Hello. What's it like down there tonight? It's been a beautiful day, about 35, and it's a nice balmy evening. Well, that's lovely to hear. And um, you've worked with lots of people who've been impacted by family violence as well. What would you say are some of the best um, changes or improvements that have been made that support people better than when you started working in this field? There's been some good law reform. Um, I work in South Australia, so um, in December 2011, we introduced new intervention order legislation, which actually supports women and children being able to stay in the family home and removing the perpetrator. Um, so that's been a significant improvement. And I think also just the increasing awareness across services in relation to domestic violence, trauma responses, and, and the consequences of it that's providing better support. Yeah, so that's um, great improvements and I'm, I'm sure that we'll be hearing more about that um, through our discussions this evening. Now I'd really like to welcome Amy. So Amy's um, someone who's had lived experience of family violence and we just appreciate so much you being with us. Um, it's a real a privilege for us and it's very courageous of you. Um, and I know that you're really involved now in, in work educating other people about family violence. And one of the programs that you've been involved in is in high schools. So could you just tell us a little bit about that one? Sure, hi everyone. Um, so a few years ago I developed a respectful relationships program and delivered it to high schools, um, basically developing resources as well for schools handling disclosures, understanding what local services are in their area geographically um, and talking to kids and giving them resources about respectful relationships, what a healthy relationship looks like, the framework of that um, and doing their dating rights, the bill of dating rights, so looking at what their rights are and their choices and going through the cycle of domestic and family violence, um, touching on sexual violence as well. So having a real um, interactive discussion with the kids um, and really supporting them and supporting the school then. and we've had a lot of disclosures come from that. Um, the kids have been really well supported uh, by the school so it's, it's um, been a really life changing program and it's something I enjoy doing. Thanks so much and um, look 
we're going to just cover a, a couple of ground rules just about the program. And the first, the first one is actually in regard to Amy. So um, a pseudonym is being used for Amy. And if you are talking about the case um, amongst colleagues, please make sure that you use this, use Amy uh, as as the name for our um, lived experience panel member, even if you know her other name. Um, now, also remember that this is like a face-to-face -face activity, so anything that you write in the general chat box can be seen by 618 now, other people. And um, if you have questions that you would like the panel to discuss, please post them in the chat box. We've also received um, several hundred questions um, submitted when you joined in, mm -hmm. so please be understanding that we're not going to be able to cover every single question that was submitted, but we've certainly picked up some themes and we will try to make sure that that's covered. And I think you'll be quite um, quite pleased with what our panellists are covering together. Um, if you want to hide the chat box, you can click the little arrow at the top of the chat box and then you can just watch the webinar without the chat box. Um, and there will be um, resources posted up on the MHPN webinar afterwards, so if resources come up for discussion, you'll have access to them later. Um, we've just um, so now what I would like to also do is just give you a little, um, well the learning outcomes you've already seen and I just want to describe the session outline to you. So we're hoping that we'll be able to understand mental health indicators better in the context of family violence, identify the key principles of the approach of each of the disciplines represented tonight. And what we find with MHPN webinars is often that there's more similarities than differences. Um, and also to explore some tips and strategies for how we can collaborate well together and um, improving the provision of care to individuals experiencing family violence. Now you've all um, read the case beforehand. What will happen is that each of our um, panellists will respond for five minutes with how they would receive, how they would work with Amy if she came to see them. And then Amy's going to respond from her perspective as someone with lived experience. Um, and so I'm just waiting because we have, okay, so we've, just so that you know, the cameras um, come on and off, uh, looked after by Redback Conferencing to do a great job. So to save bandwidth, when people are not speaking, the cameras are going off, but they will come back, they're still on the telephone. So what I would like to do is um, welcome our first responder, which is our GP, Kelsey. And she's going to just respond to us as she would to Amy. So um, Amy is the mother of an 11-year-old girl called Libby. Amy endured significant physical, emotional and psychological abuse at the hands of Libby's father, both before, during and after their relationship. So Kelsey, I was wondering um, how you would go about how you would think about helping Amy when she came to see you. Oh, thanks very much. And I'd like to begin really after reading the story by apologising on behalf of my profession um, because the GP certainly did not respond to Amy in any way that uh, we would like them to. And I also like to start by saying that as we're all thinking about how we would respond, um, sometimes we know for sure that there'll be people out of the 641 who are listening who've actually experienced this themselves um, as a health practitioner um, from their partners. And so I hope whatever I say is empathic to their experience. And I thought we might just start by making sure we're sort of on the same wavelength about what we talk about. We, you know, we can talk about family violence where it's actually involving a lot of other members of the family, but this case is really about um, by a partner and obviously has great effects on the children too. And, and certainly Amy's case does reflect the breadth across physical, psychological um, uh, types of intimidation and controlling behaviours. And from work I've done, we know that one in 10 women attending general practice will have this sort of experience. Um, so if you're a full-time practitioner GP out there, then that's five women a week, mostly who aren't identified in any way. And so um, really I just wanted to make that point that in fact GPs aren't responding. <laughs> and so, but I obviously in my own general practice 
um, and very well aware that of the need to ask. And often we ask when there's a whole range of presenting symptoms and I try and ask in all these sorts of situations. Again, Amy has experienced many of these um, things. Um, but, but what I see is that it's mostly the mental health presentations that result in um, presentations to general practice. It's less likely that the injuries, as in Amy's case, they're going more to the emergency department sometimes. And of course, the, the reproductive health. So, so for us as GPs, you know, anybody listening, we really have to be aware of this, particularly people presenting with depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress. Um, and I have to try and remind myself on a regular basis that you know, the children in these families are experiencing a lot of um, uh, things when partner violence is going on, including bedwetting and sleeping disorders and other things, and then mm -hmm. as adolescents. So it's great that Amy's going in and, and doing this work in, in, in school. Um, so how should people ask? And, you know, I do a lot of teaching on this, but this is the sort of things I do. I start general and move into more specific things about whether they're afraid of their partner, do they feel safe at home, has they actually been physically threatened or hurt. And often I normalise it by saying violence is very common in the home and I frequently ask my patients. So that's sort of how I go about asking and I find that works. And we know that women are you know, almost three times as likely to tell if they're directly asked. And this is a whole, you know, I, 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 I use this because this is what um, qualitative studies have shown and it's sort of what Amy's saying as well, that that they that we you know, they really want to be asked. They want some posters up to give them an idea that it might be helpful. And then it's really basic good communication skills which weren't present um, in the GP today with story. But it's taking some time to listen and non judgmental validation and understanding that this is a chronic problem um, and it's not going to be solved in one or two sessions. But GPC people for a long time, so it's actually, you know, quite able that they can follow up, and and the key to it is respecting what they want. Um, and I have the privilege of being involved in the World Health Organization guidelines for health professionals generally, not just GPs. And this really emphasises women-centred care that we all need to be trained, that we need to case find, as I just said, um, written information. Um, there was no evidence that we shouldn't use do mandatory reporting for domestic violence. And it is that psychological treatments that are um, treatments for depression and others do work for women who um, have partner violence. And that mother-child interventions, which we have a real lack of, I think, in, mm. in Australia for being able to refer to, um, also work. And so I think people would be aware of women-centred care. Um, but the, the extra pieces I talk to GPs about and I do myself is assisting her to increase her safety and her children's safety and providing or mobilising social support because um, women are very isolated, similar to what they need. And I taught GPs in, around, and in an intervention called WEAVE, which um, Carmel was talking about a different way, but um, in the WEAVE study. And that actually showed that GPs could be taught to do this women-centred care and women were asked, uh, more about the safety of themselves and their children and had less depression in a large randomised controlled trial. So I think it can be done and I think a lot of GPs can do it. And I like this mnemonic that WHO got, says, which is live, live, whatever, listen, inquire about needs, validate, enhance safety and support. Um, and I ask about safety in a very simple way. I mean, these are obviously complex risk assessments. But this is the way I do, and I really base it on what the woman feels and how safe she is, whether she's afraid to go home. And most people in general practice aren't afraid to go home that day. They've been dealing with it a lot. Has she been threatened with weapons, uh, violence been escalating, and a drug emergency? And I go through a safety plan with women. Maybe not on the first visit if they're safe to go home, but on subsequent. And so I just want to flag that in fact we're trying to reach out to more women and this is from my job as a university person. We're trialling, taking some of the elements face to face, similar to mental health interventions, onto um, an internet based safety decision aid and healthy relationship tool. And we're currently recruiting volunteers. So if you could all recruit one person, they have to be under 50. 
and really this is a, a, you know an extraordinarily we, the pilot feedback has been fantastic about this um, I decide about my relationship so um, I'd love people to, to do that if they could and really for, for resources the College of GPs I've been involved has got a lot of resources about um, and, and the main one being the white book and I just thought I'd flag those because they've been we've been getting a lot of feedback that mental health practitioners um, would like that and finally, just, you know, I think every GP has a role. They have to be ready to be open to recognise the symptoms, respond to disclosures, um, address the risk and safety issues, review the patient for follow-up and support, refer, reflect on our own attitudes and management of abuse and violence, and finally respect our patients, our colleagues and ourselves. Because if we don't do that, we can't hope to do this work. So that's how I approach it based on all these other things that I've been involved with. Thanks so much, Kelsey. And I, I'm, the REC GP resources are really good and I would encourage any GPs online to, um, to look at those. Um, just uh, for the participants, we have a technical issue which is why we haven't been able to see Kelsey. We're back are working behind the scenes to fix that and um, hopefully we'll be able to see um, our other panellists. So I would very much now like to welcome Carmel to give us a response from the perspective of a psychologist. Hi Carmel. Hi Mary and thank you for having me on the panel. Um, I've just started off with a couple of quotes because they kind of underpin um, how I approach the work. Um, I love this quote from Colin Ross that uh, trauma is to psychological medicine what bacteria is to physical medicine because I think that the trauma of domestic violence is often underrated and people present with depression or anxiety or some physical symptom and uh, it's um, often not explored enough. Uh, and the other is the quote from Alan Wade that violence is always about humiliation and resistance is always about dignity and in fact recovery I think is about reclaiming one's dignity after the uh, experience that people have been through. Uh, I think that the um, broad range of how we respond to trauma um, often applies to domestic violence but um, many of the trauma work too also is based on a traumatic experience and yet domestic violence is a series of traumatic experience and often people um, are struggling to survive on a daily basis if not physically, certainly psychologically. So I've just um, put up what some of the symptoms are only because uh, there are all kinds of ways in which it might present and uh, sometimes people just deal with the symptom in the same way that sometimes the police just deal with domestic violence as if it's a single incident when it's part of a pattern. Uh, so it's not that everybody of course who's suffering from insomnia or um, is, has eating difficulties um, is going to be someone who is also living with or has lived with violence but the other way around, that often people who uh, have lived with violence or are still living with violence um, find that it affects them in all kinds of ways such as um, uh, leading them into um, medication abuse, substance abuse, uh, sometimes a gambling. Um, certainly there are a number of ways in which people's thinking is affected and then we often have people who have uh, trouble concentrating, planning, getting to their school, kids to school on time, uh, problems in the workplace that are related to the fact that they're um, basically trying to survive psychologically. Um, and certainly depression and anxiety are very common presenting issues uh, for people who are living with violence. Um, a number of uh, women I've seen who've presented with depression and would often not even identify themselves as being victims of domestic violence. I find within a few sessions, if not the first one, that I'm saying, look, uh, I'm not sure whether you're suffering from depression, but you're certainly suffering from oppression. And uh, problems with uh, anger and irritability are not as common because uh, uh, with uh, most um, people who are living with uh, violence at home being uh, women and children, often it's um, uh, the symptoms are inward looking if you like, but um, somebody can be um, have a, develop a problem with irritability and anger because of it. Um, certainly domestic violence affects you socially and in fact there's um, deliberate attempts by perpetrators to isolate people socially so that 
uh, it means that they lose friends they've had and it impairs their ability to form new friendships and in fact unfortunately often the perpetrator in the worst instances becomes the focus of their lives psychologically and they uh, sometimes what a counsellor is in the first place is a bit of a reality check of uh, somebody who can say to them well, well that doesn't sound like a very good um, space that you're in at home. Something as simple as that. Um, the real problems and the lasting problems I think are the existential problems where um, people suddenly, uh, sorry, gradually <laughs> more than suddenly lose a sense of their own self-efficacy and they start to feel that they're useless people, bad mothers, um, they'll never recover, uh, they can't trust people um, or that it's all their own fault and they've brought it on themselves. And uh, you need very careful, sensitive work to help someone rebuild their lives afterwards. Um, we do also do the work that's related more directly to post-traumatic stress symptoms such as dealing with panic attacks and um, uh, people who become either emotionally labile or uh, emotionally numb and uh, uh, very much often in survival mode. Uh, I wanted to just mention, look, it's very hard to put into um, a single slide <laughs> everything that you might need to think of in working with someone. Uh, but um, I guess it's these kinds of areas of activity in counselling that I think are really essential. And the first is to really believe what you're hearing. It fascinates me that if somebody t says that they've been, you know, mugged as they were leaving their shop or they've been, um, you know, some crazy person has um, attacked their car or themselves, they're usually believed. But often when women talk about their experiences uh, and in terms of domestic violence, they're not believed. Um, why the onus suddenly becomes upon them, if you like, um, to be believed uh, is, is uh, awful and has quite ramifications for them. And if you read Amy's story, she certainly had examples of how she felt not believed and judged. Um, relieving of symptoms is very important. Uh, grieving for what people um, have lost, not just in terms of um, have lost uh, in terms of their relationship, and sometimes they grieve uh, in different ways for that, but they're also losing um, the kind of parenting they wanted for their children, or they've lost relationships they've had with other family members. They've lost future hopes and dreams. There's all kinds of grief. And then, of course, part of the work is um, the, achieve, the achieving, which is basically looking at new perceptions of the story, I think, and a renewed sense of self. And uh, it's a capacity, I think, on the part of counsellors and um, other support workers to be able to help them set small achievable goals together. And I call it the WEAVE model because all of those four aspects happen in and out of each other. They um, move backwards and forwards. So that four tasks of the model keep being revisited and it requires a great deal of patience often working with someone. And I noticed a lot of the questions are about why do women um, keep going back and why do they stay, etc., etc. And uh, so you do need a fair bit of patience in this work. Um, I absolutely believe that with appropriate support, people will make good decisions for themselves. It may not be at the pace you'd hope. Um, and uh, the best practice elements really I've taken from the APS guidelines for working with women which is about um, being uh, respectful of women and attending to their safety and um, making sure that your language indicates that the perpetrator is accountable for the violence it's not being mutual. Uh, so being non-judgmental and I'm sure um, reading Amy's story she experienced quite a bit of uh, judgment and not enough validation often. Um, I've included this um, kind of new cycle of violence that uh, we've developed in my workplace because we felt that the um, traditional cycle of violence that's often um, uh, talked about has quite mutual language. I'm not quite sure how a honeymoon phase got into a cycle of violence because there's nothing more mutual really than a honeymoon, um, hopefully. Um, and so we don't talk about a gradual build up and uh, an explosion as if it's some kind of pressure cooker. We talk about intimidation and standover and an assault. And we don't talk about a honeymoon phase. I talk about it as a false remorse phase. And I know that sometimes remorse um, is often seen as quite 
genuine and experienced as genuine but in my book if it was real remorse it wouldn't be a cycle because something would be done about it so that it didn't happen again. Um, so uh, that's it um, for the time being for me and I'm hoping a bit later to be able to talk a little bit about um, changing the language in the way that we work. Thanks so much Kelsey and uh, Carmel, sorry I'm distracted by um, we're sorting out a technical issue, which is fine. Um, what I wanted to also say, Carmel, was um, when you were talking about believing, there's been a lot of comments in the um, general chat about male victims of domestic violence. And while it is a lot less common, it does still happen. And I think sometimes men feel even more that they're disbelieved, perhaps even more than oh, women. Yes, I absolutely so, agree with that. I mean, I take the view that um, the, that violence is not okay, that it's a choice people make to be violent and that uh, if you're experiencing violence whether um, you're a man or a woman or a child then there ought to be a response that is respectful and hears you. Yeah. So I just I did want to just acknowledge that for the for the people in the participant box who've been commenting about men because we, we do care about them as well. Um, yes, I think the reason that we mainly use the female pronoun is because of the statistics. Yeah. Um, so I'd now like to welcome Jack. And um, Jack, you're going to speak to us about how a social worker might respond to Amy's situation. Thank you. Thank you. And it's really good to be here. I want to talk about, I want to start by talking about the dual focus with which social work utilises. Ash Swartz said back in 1960, we recognise that private troubles are public issues. So that what might be impacting on the individual before us is actually a, can be a socio-political issue. And I think it's really relevant to domestic violence because domestic violence, as Carmel has been saying, is about experiencing trauma what can be known as the symptoms of abuse that have been listed very clearly so far in this webinar but it's also a form of oppression. And so for me it's really important as social workers that we recognise not only the support to the individual herself but also what we need to do to advocate for social change. Social work views the person in their environment um, and so therefore for me we need to move away from looking at what, asking ourselves what is wrong with Amy as some sort of individual pathology and asking ourselves, wondering about what has happened to Amy. I think the prevalence of domestic violence in women's lives means we need to be alert to the reality so that whenever, whatever area of social work we're practicing in, we need, when we're supporting women particularly, we need to be aware that their domestic violence may well be part of her lived reality. So we need to be open to that. We need to be able to receive that information from a woman so she can feel able to disclose and we also need to be willing to explore this and for me what's really important about that is that it's done in a really safe and appropriate environment where the worker is aware where is the, the perpetrator, you know, is he in the waiting room, is he outside, what does that mean for her if she discloses now in regards to her safety and I totally support what Kelsey said earlier in regards to the sorts of questions and how to introduce that, that conversation. Responding, how we respond to a disclosure is critical. As Amy has indicated in her case study, feeling blamed and judged, in my experience of supporting women over many years, that is a really common experience. So I think, you know, the good old core conditions of social work, empathy, positive regard, genuineness, we need to believe, support and advocate. One of the things I find really important, and this goes to Carmel's point in regards to some of the questions in the um, that participants are asking about trying to understand why she may stay in a relationship or why she may return, is for me when I first started working in this area was to understand I needed to work out what her her response to her partner's use of violence, what that meant to her and how she had managed that. What I've learned over my years of practice is women do respond to the violence, they learn, they manage it, they learn strategies and there are acts of resistance as Carmel's alluded to and those acts of resistance are particularly important. So 
as social workers, we work from a strengths-based model. We need to really listen carefully and look at what we can pull out from what can be a really horrible story to see where her strengths are and what she's done to survive and really challenge that notion that women are, are passive recipients of violence. One of the key aspects, of course, is, is utilising risk assessments and conducting safety plan, planning. Um, risk assessment tools have developed considerably over, over the years and I think, you know, certainly in South Australia we, we have a family safety framework which is uh, across all agencies. I'll, I don't have time to go into details about that at the moment. But in regards to both risk assessment and safety planning, what I want to say is that the starting point needs to be that we respect Amy or the woman as the expert of her life. She may not have called it safety planning, but she has been doing it. Women will do all sorts of resourceful things to keep herself and her children as safe as she can. So for me in safety planning with a woman, I will always work out, you know, find out from her first what she's already doing. I might be able to give her some information that's useful, but it is very much a mutual exercise which comes back to a fundamental point and one I think that fits really well with social work, that we walk side by side with the woman. We are alert to the power imbalances in the relationship in domestic violence that's particularly crucial because of course he has been abusing his power over her. So it's been a really disempowering experience. I think as workers the worst thing we can do is to use disempowering practice. And so that's something to be really crucial of and really respecting her autonomy. The final point I want to make is just in regards to the, the importance of recognising the impact of DV on the relationship between mother and child. It's a very common tactic that perpetrators use and she <clears throat> is often feeling like she's a terrible mother, that if only she'd done things better, etc, etc. So I think workers need to be really aware of what they can do to strengthen the mother-child relationship and pay strong attention to that. I work from a trauma lens and I have to say when I first read Judith Herman's seminal work Trauma and Recovery, first published in 1992, it was a bit of a life-changing moment. There's a, a particular chapter in that entitled Captivity which I feel gives a, a wonderful explanation in regards to understanding the trauma responses of the experience of DV. So if you want to understand why women do what they do, read that chapter. I also find using a narrative therapy approach can be very effective in working with women. Narrative therapy, it fits really well with social work values, principles and practices. It externalises the problem from the person which is crucial because so often a woman will feel that she is the problem because he's told her that for a very long time. So just that externalisation can be a really useful starting point. It also has a strong focus on what meaning she's made of her experiences, which I think really works in this context. And what narrative therapy is interested in is exploring that problem-saturated dominant story of, of her life, which is very much the story that the perpetrator has got into her head. And, but it's seeking out what we call unique outcomes, which are those acts of resistance I've mentioned, to build up the woman's alternative story. So you start with this, this really horrific, problem-laden story where she feels horribly responsible to blame, her self-esteem is extremely low, and you can work with her over time to recognise her strengths, her acts of resistance, to build another story that actually has meaning for her life where the perpetrator is held accountable and she's freed from that sense of blame. My last comment is in regards to collaborative practice. I want to make the point that domestic violence is a pervasive epidemic issue. It's a political issue. It is not an issue that one worker or one agency itself can attend to. So we need to work together. We need to work across agencies. And to do so, we need a shared understanding of domestic violence. We need to understand it is an abuse of power and what that means, that it is an experience of trauma and working from that trauma-informed perspective. And we need to have a shared purpose, which I think needs to be about the woman's safety and autonomy and about the abuser's visibility and accountability because he often gets ignored. Advocacy is crucial. 
both in regards to directly for the woman herself but also in regards to systemic advocacy to improve laws, to improve service responses. There can be times when it's frustrating and so I think something that we call institutional empathy can be important to let so that you know where the worker from that other service is coming from and that can help build some trust and rapport. And just one quick mention, the, to experience domestic violence is to almost inevitably involve legal processes. They're really intimidating, there's a huge power imbalance, it's very hierarchical so I think it's crucial that the woman is supported through to navigate those processes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jack. Look, I'm really pleased to note that um, that the panelists are covering a lot of the um, topics which people have submitted in their questions before the webinar. So um, I'm, I'm going to um, spend a little bit longer. I'm not I'm not making people hurry up in this section because you're actually answering a lot of the questions people have, and this is just so useful. Um, so thanks so much, Jack. Um, and finally, I would like to welcome Amy. Um, to speak to us about how things um, were for Amy. Hi everyone, I've just been um, trying to answer lots of questions there. So thank you for all those brilliant questions for the panel, that's fantastic. Um, I guess my first um, slide we'll go into is understand the dynamics, but obviously Kelsey's covered this off, thanks Kelsey for that. Um, but obviously understand the dynamics and the background to what is domestic and family violence and knowing that it's, it comes from a perpetrator's desire for power and control. It's not just a one-off incident where someone's been angry or the woman said something to make him angry and those kind of victim blaming um, conversations that we'll discuss on another slide. Um, and it covers psychological, emotional, social, physical, cultural, sexual and financial abuse. So we've got on the next slide the Duluth model wheel, which some of you will be familiar with, I'm sure, the power and control wheel. Um, do I click oh, on something here? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. There we are. Um, so I won't obviously go through all this right now, but with the power and control wheel, um, and I love what Carmel had up as well, it's obviously using intimidation, the emotional abuse, the isolation, um, using the children or pets against them, threatening children and pets. Um, economics or financial abuse um, and, and it's that walking on eggshells um, as part of that as we explore the honeymoon cycle before but also walking on eggshells so using that power and control. Sometimes for women in DV it can just be a look so women might present without physical injuries at the time to a GP but it might be the emotional abuse that's happening, the psychological breakdown, psychological abuse and just a look that, that the perpetrator gives her to indicate that that cycle of violence is coming. Um, next slide, please. Yep, <laughs> I sure. see up here. I can just click. Sorry. Okay. So real time stats um, with DV homicide. It's the leading. Sorry, DV is actually the leading cause of death and injury in women under 45 in Australia. And that's that's pretty full on in comparison to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and, and um, other illnesses. Currently, one woman in Australia is murdered each week um, by her current or former partner. We've actually got that at 13 deaths in seven weeks in Australia. So we're nearly at two deaths a week as a result of DV homicide. And obviously we've had children um, dying um, at the hands of um, a perpetrator as well. So we need to really address, address this and take these stats quite seriously when it comes to um, assisting and supporting women and, and children through this, this pathway to safety. Again with safety planning, a lot of um, refuges um, and DV services and emergency hotlines will help with safety planning which is really important. A lot of people think it's, it's easy for women to just get in the car and leave but there needs to be safety planning around that. Um, the most dangerous times for a woman are actually when she's pregnant and when she tries to leave. One in three Australian women have experienced physical violence since the age of 15. Uh, one in four Australian women have experienced emotional abuse since the age of 15. Hence why it's so important to go into schools, in, in my opinion, um, and start addressing these issues quite early. Uh, one in four Australian children witness DV against their mother or stepmother. And again, these are only reported statistics. So in, in my opinion of the children and the women I've worked with over the last nine years, I believe it's a lot higher than, than one in four children. DV actually accounts for 40% of police time. Um, and the cost to the Australian economy is $13.6 billion per year. That's only getting worse. So let's talk about some helpful interaction and responses. So the first point I want to talk about is treating holistically. So for example, if a woman presents at, at a GP's office, um, you know, for, for a broken arm, it's not just about treating the, the physical, it's also about addressing the emotional trauma sustained um, and then not adding to the financial stress, but also perhaps billing the patient if she's requested to be bulk billed. 
um, because then again that impacts on the financial abuse, it can impact on uh, the perpetrator knowing that the woman has access to the GP, if he can see on a, on a bank statement that she's um, perhaps done an FPOS transaction at the GP to pay for the um, consultation, then he will see that she has gone and sought medical treatment and that will then um, lead her back into um, the cycle of abuse. Um, so I guess addressing all aspects of DV affecting the victim and seeking to refer her to other health professionals, so maybe onto a community service agency or onto the police or onto a DV service to, to completely engage her in that system, so not just treating that, that broken uh, rib or, or arm. Um, the biggest one for me, and I really need to drive this home, is avoiding dialogue that victim blames and shame. So I know beforehand Kelsey touched on some really helpful and, and positive um, dialogue. So it, People in general, family, friends, people at the shop, doctors, um, and um, you know anyone in, in any sort of um, industry can see someone with an arm, you know, that's hurt. And say, what did you do to yourself? You know, what happened? But when you've got a woman where you suspect DV is the case, to actually say to her, you know, what did you do to make him angry, is really inappropriate. A lot of women are going through victim blaming and shaming themselves and feeling that they've done something to cause his behaviour. So taking that away from from her and not saying, you know, why don't you just leave? Actually using phrases that allow exploration of her decision making and choices which she hasn't had to this point. So perhaps asking, would you like support to make an appointment with a legal service? Um, you know, would you like me to ring a, a DD service for you here? Do you have a trusted GP you can see for your injuries? Um, fulfilling your role in the present with a future focus. So as a GP you might treat a physical injury and you know address the emotional trauma with a, a referral or antidepressants. Um, but think ahead to the evidence that police might need for a possible criminal charge. So making sure you take comprehensive notes, um, that those notes are legible, that you've outlined exactly what you've seen, um, you know, supporting her if she wants to report to police, um, ensuring that you know, perhaps has one of her friends or family member or someone taken photos of the injuries, ensuring that in a timely manner, like supporting her to see the police so they can get evidence again of those injuries. Um, so thinking about the future and, and what is it you can do now to help her to ensure her safety, ensure that, that the perpetrator is held accountable. Um, avoiding dialogue that minimises the impact of DV on the victim or ignores disclosure. So again, not sort of saying, you'll be right, that'll heal, or I've known John for eight years, he's a good bloke, he just gets like this a bit when he's drunk. So not minimising the behaviour of, of the perpetrator. Um, maybe saying to them, you know, have you talked to a DV service for information to ensure you and your children are safe? Using dialogue that helps support them to get to safety. Also ask the victim what is it that you need right now, like how can I assist in helping you and listen to what they say. Sometimes that's all they need is just to talk and they need someone who's going to believe them, who's going to receive the information and help them to do something about it. So really encourage them to, um, to seek support. Mental health, so care plan or plan to deem the victim an unfit parent. So obviously there's a mental health care plan. There's a real difficulty and consistency of engagement for the victim. So if they've only got sort of 10 visits within that, that um, frame, it can be difficult if they're actually navigating their way at the time through the legal system. They're actually going um, through property settlement. They're in a refuge or getting back out into the community. They're trying, to, um, they're trying to relocate their children to a new school. They're looking at DV orders, at criminal. Um, the criminal legal process can take up to two years to get to court. So a DV order is civil law. Um, if they breach it or the police actually take enough action in the first instance and there's enough evidence to support a criminal charge, then that will still take two years to get to court. So it's a long time for a woman um, to be going through that process. And so if she's engaged in a mental health care plan, a lot of the time you won't get to, to the historical context. You'll be dealing with the issues here and now that are presenting. Um, also the affordability around the mental health care plan. So many psychologists are still charging a big gap which is really unattainable for victims who've experienced financial abuse and are having to perhaps relocate or um, be re-employed um, and seek, seek employment. And it's also difficult for them to get to appointments if they are in a job full time. So also finding the right counsellor or psychologist for them. Um, the reason I bring up here deeming the victim an unfit parent, some of you are probably thinking what, what's she talking about? But when we talk about mental health, I think we're talking about it here obviously from two perspectives. We've got a perpetrator that might claim mental health in a court environment as a defence or justification um, for, for their behaviour and for their abuse. And so then when you've got a victim who's um, been diagnosed with mental health, they might find that they're not comfortable with that diagnosis. They don't accept the diagnosis because they've got a perpetrator currently in court stating that they've got mental health and that's why they're abusing their victim. They don't want to actually link with that. Um, 
There's also um, the issues around perpetrators using the patient's mental health against them to intimidate them emotionally um, and physically. So if they're still residing together, it can be that the perpetrator knows that the victim is taking prescription medication perhaps, so engaging in counselling and can start using emotional abuse and calling them a psycho and telling them they need to take their meds and making all these sort of derogatory comments to further um, continue that emotional abuse. There's also society's misconceptions around mental health and the victim um, feeling weak um, and also concerned and doubtful of how to live with mental health conditions, not having it um, completely explained to them um, and also for um, you know practitioners to look at the reason of why. Why is the victim presenting with, um, with a, a mental health issue because they've been through trauma, because they've been traumatised and victimised. Um, and also with the um, perpetrator seeking access to the children um, in court, they um, will often try to then use um, a mental health against the, um, the, say perhaps the mother who's the main primary caregiver for the children in order to gain access and make her look like she's an unfit parent. So that's why victims um, will often um, really avoid um, continue on participating initially in, uh, in mental health programs. So we've talked there obviously about why um, the fight or flight response and it being used against them. Um, and there we go. I, I have heaps more to say, so if you'd like to ask me anything else, I think just I'll get back to the, um, the general chat box. Thanks, Mary. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, now I know that you had, um, I, I'm going to invite Kelsey back in because we weren't able to see her before, but we should be now. So I know that you had a question for Kelsey around, mm -hmm. um, the way that um, professionals train train their workers uh, and that you're quite passionate at a, a, about the training that goes into professionals. So I wondered if you wanted to address that question to Kelsey. Oh no, we've lost Kelsey on camera again, but she's still on the um, telephone, so please just ask her and she'll be there. Okay. Hi Kelsey. Hi, how are you? Good. Okay, Someone so will be able to see me eventually. <laughs> Kelsey even said that she combed her hair. And we yeah, I did. Her. So I anyway, Amy, right. please go ahead. Kelsey, my question's quite lengthy, but here it is. So in a changing world where society deals with increased substance abuse, unemployment, CV-related deaths and disability, coupled with a very weak justice system, how do we encourage the university, the medical bodies and the medical fraternity at large to commit to annual and ongoing domestic and family violence training and to recognise the pivotal role they play and the responsibilities they have as frontline responders in the treatment of victims? It's a great question and one that I um, am obviously passionately trying to address. I think there's um, an interesting thing to think about that um, the College of GPs has done amazing work. I've surveyed all the medical schools to try and see how much they do on domestic violence. Um, and it's on average less than three hours so in the whole medical course. So for the nursing course and the psychology courses and some of the social work courses and some of the psychiatry courses are exactly the same. So my experience of all mental health professionals and general practitioners is that the vast majority of them have not had specialist training. Maybe not the people who are online tonight, but generally. So we have a major problem that child abuse tends to be taught, but confronting domestic violence face to face does not seem to be. Um, and I think that there are ways of doing it. I like the UK system where child safeguarding training is mandatory rather than mandatory reporting. And people are making mandatory domestic violence attached to that child safeguarding. So it's, it's us joining together and, and lobbying, but the problem is different people are control a different training program. So um, certainly, as I said, the College of GPs, we're doing an enormous amount of training. Um, so we are trying, it's just hard to make it mandatory. May I actually ask another question, Mary? I'm sorry, yeah, but sure. this one's come to sure. me of, Kel of Kelsey. So I understand when we, when we talk about mandatory reporting and child safeguarding and I have obviously my my stance on I'd like to see mandatory reporting but okay so tell me this then if a woman's um, pregnant and she's presenting to the hospital and she's got evidence and they've got a history case file of um, DV happening why is it not reported then because there is a child involved when she's pregnant? It, so, 
Yeah, so some um, of the law includes that the unborn child and some don't and they vary across mm. the state. Um, and I completely agree with you. I think the issue is also our child protection services and um, that's the great difficulty. They Child protection services tend to ignore the fact that if the father's being violent towards the mother, that that's detrimental to the child. Mm. You know, it, 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 yeah. it, you know, they're drowning, but it's it, mm. it's the fact that when I try and uh, say report to child first here in Victoria and then to child protection because of emotional abuse and neglect because of the what um, has been happening with the mother and the father, and then they separate, and then the father uses the children as pawns. Mm. It, it's just not seen as able to get up to the limit where it will be taken notice of compared to severe physical and sexual abuse. Kelsey, um, thank you both for that. I'm just going to continue with Kelsey. There is a lot of um, discussion in the general chat and in the questions that came in before about um, about how, how do we help children in this situation. And there was one mm. specific question. We've got some lawyers participating as well. So there's some lawyers that are really passionate about trying to do the right thing by victims of domestic violence as well. And how can uh, courts sometimes grant, you know, the father of the, ch the child has access to the children as part of the custody agreement. How can we support women who have to release their child to the person who harms them for custody? Um, I mean, it's perhaps a bit specific, but Kelsey, if you have any general comments about protecting yes. children. And yeah, look, this is, this is um, this is something that is passionately an issue for me because I have to support the women and the children. Can people see me now? <laughs> Maybe. Um, support the women and the children. When the child is having to do webcams with a father on a regular basis, has to go to the father, comes back very behaviourally disturbed. And um, I think that you know the current Royal Commission in Victoria needs to really fix the family law system where um, any dad's a good enough dad, even one who's abused the mother. I, I think that this is an area that is the thing that breaks my heart the most, is watching women have to send their children off to perpetrators of violence against them, but often perpetrators of abuse against the children. And it gets suppressed in court. The women are told not to bring up family violence. Thanks, Kelsey. They really are told by lawyers not to bring it up because they will look like an alienating parent. Yeah. And so I'm not a lawyer, so you know, I'm sure the general chat's going mad, but it's a really major issue. So look, Jack, I think this would be an appropriate point to bring you back in as a social worker if you had any comments about, about children and justice. And it is. I've spent, I've spent several years actually working in women's shelters and so I've seen firsthand as well as, as the research um, what happens to both women and children through family law processes and for me I can only heartily agree with what Kelsey has said. When a woman and, a, and children, you know, they would come into our emergency accommodation, they would be housed. We would see, I mean, the first step to any recovery, the first step in any trauma process is safety. And without safety, healing and recovery is very, very difficult. When a mother and children are required to continue to interact with their perpetrator, that really makes recovery very difficult. We also need to appreciate that separation is the most dangerous time for women. In there are more fatalities, DV deaths, shortly after separation than at any other time. So just because a woman has um, left the relationship does not mean she's safe. The number of times that I've worked with women who have been told by child protection they must leave or they will be failing to protect their children, they leave, they come to a DV service, they come into accommodation, he goes to the family law courts, they then have to, on their own, as it's a civil matter, try to, to present why they are, have concerns around further contact and interaction with him. They are told by lawyers not to say it and, and there's a lot of research evidence to support that and we've got a long way to go before we make that safe and that is detrimental to women and children. So um, I, 
I'd like to bring Carmel in here. So Carmel, as a psychologist, how can we support um, women and also children? You know, the GPs, the psychologists, social workers, we're all seeing children as well and adolescents. So I just wondered if you wanted to talk about, about these issues. Yeah, happy to do that. We have some programs that support children and uh, children inevitably are impacted. Uh, they can feel sad, helpless, um, guilty, uh, frightened and uh, in fact in relation to family court sometimes uh, one of the issues is um, they're not believed and often not heard in family court and so as Jack says they have to keep on having contact with someone that um, is frightening and often dangerous. Um, so I think that uh, safety is certainly paramount. We can't always ensure their safety depending on what family court orders are. We can do our best. I absolutely believe children have a right to be involved in decisions that are made about them, um, even when uh, they're quite young. Uh, and also that assessment and support of children needs to change over time because level of risk changes over time and their capacity uh, and uh, ways of responding change over time. Um, children vary a lot in what they, um, what they will say, who they will tell, um, uh, what they will tell and to whom. And so I think probably what's best is for as many of us as possible to be as open as we can to what we're hearing out from children and be as gentle as we can in exploring what are often just labelled as behavioural difficulties uh, and uh, in, in many instances are parents behaving badly. Um, so where possible we check safety and assess the risk and uh, try to do that often with the help of the child and with the protective parent. Um, it's often useful to find out who else is involved with the child uh, and whether you need to talk to them, whether you can get consent to talk to them. It's important to be clear about your role, I think. Uh, some workers are mandated, some are not. Uh, some are able to put some things in place and other workers can do other things. Uh, basically, I guess if you're giving children a message, the messages are that violence is wrong, that it's not their fault, that there is not an excuse for a, a grown-up um, to hurt them. There may be an explanation, but an explanation is not an excuse. And uh, whatever people say to you, if someone in your home is hurting you or hurting someone else in your home, it is not your fault. And the other message is that they're not alone that there, um, there are people who can help and to um, what helps um, encourage that is really the sorts of things that Amy was talking about in terms of being non-judgmental, really hearing, not being afraid to ask the exploratory questions in a um, non-threatening way and an empowering kind of way. Um, children often need reassurance that what they're feeling is normal. It's very common for children to believe that violence is their fault in the same way that even with um, um, separation where there's no violence, children often believe they've had some part in the breakdown of their parents' relationship. Um, so uh, saying something to a child like, well, you know, you seem to be looking very sad or um, this is a really hard thing to talk about, isn't it? Um, even to say, you know, I'm a bit worried about you. Would you like to talk about it? Um, I care about you. I'd really like to be able to help. Um, children know uh, uh, better than anyone often um, whether it's safe or not to talk and who to. And so it's about keeping the door open, if you like, to the conversations they might be willing to have. Even if they don't disclose to you, um, if they've had a positive conversation where they haven't felt uh, as if they've been shut down or judged or whatever, um, it may mean that you can't do something but they will be more likely to talk to someone else in the future when uh, they feel a bit braver or are more able to, to do that. Um, often there are enormous threats made to um, victims and to children about what will happen if uh, the um, truth is told and so it, uh, it's just about a matter of uh, trying not to react, if you like, to the bad behaviour. Children's bad behaviour is, is uh, like a barometer of what's happening for them in their lives. Thanks so much, Colin. Um, what, what you were just saying then about, um, we, there was a lot of questions um, from the participants about um, other groups, not, not just children, but adults who are in other ways disadvantaged, so deaf people, culturally and linguistically diverse people, transgender people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and I think that um, being able to say, even you know, is 
is anything happening to you at home that, that you, makes you frightened or that, and they might say, no, everything's fine. And then you can say, as you just talked about for the children to say, look, if anything like that does ever happen to you, you are really welcome to talk to me about it and you will not be judged and you're safe here. And I, I think just making people know that you're a safe person to talk to and giving those yeah. messages that that is never okay may even be new information to some groups. You know, some of the behaviours that, that we know are not okay might even be acceptable in some of the environments that people have come from. So just giving that good health information is so important. Um, Kelsey, I wanted to bring you back in because I know that you had something more that you wanted to say about working with children. And I think yeah. we might have your camera. Welcome. Uh, I don't know whether people can see me, but it'd be we good. Can. We um, can. I, I've been working with Anita Morris, who's a social worker, and she's done a PhD where she's worked very closely with mothers and, and children and talked to them about it. And the things that assisted their agency or their ability to feel more empowered, the children, is obviously um, some of the things Carmel's been talking about. But also there needs to be not just talking about it between the mother and the children, and I've just put a resource by Cathy Humphreys up on the general chat, um, particularly for the younger children, but, but some awareness of, it, you know, that there's something wrong. That seems to actually be a prerequisite for the children getting agency. Secondly, I think it's a distance from the perpetrator and that might be emotionally or physically, like if people move states or whatever, but, but also if they can be helped to emotionally um, uh, distance themselves from the perpetrator. And the third thing is having a sense of family resiliency. So encouraging things such as, you know, just rituals and meals and, and co-constructing of families. So, you know, many of these things are then used in a trilogue between the practitioner, the GP she was looking at, and the child and the mother. For so many times we only get the mother's perspective on the child rather than looking for the child's voice. Thanks, Kelsey. Amy, I'd like to bring you back in. I, I, we're sort of progressing on from children. I wanted to talk about adolescents and I know that a lot of your work's been in high school and particularly around um, promoting respectful relationships. I have been really alarmed um, in my work with adolescents about what kind of behaviours young men and women think are, are okay. And I think that personally I think things have gone backwards since I was at high school in the yeah. 80s in regards to what, what women think is okay, young women. Yeah. So I just yeah. wondered if you'd like to comment about adolescence and violence in relationships and also about working with schools. Yeah, thanks Mary. Um, I guess we've got it, and similarly when I was in school in the 90s, we're showing our age now, <laughs> um, you know, We've got now so much more um, desensitisation to violence. So we've got online video games, you know, everything's online. We've got iPads, we've got um, mobile phones, we've got billboards um, all around us at bus stops and, up, you know, we're driving along. And there's so much more um, sexualisation, there's so much more violence, violence on TV, every TV show you turn on, the news is more violence. Um, and when you've got children who are being unsupervised, who it's up to them to make their own decisions about what they're watching on TV and what sort of um, online media they're engaging in and what gaming, um, they just become really desensitised. And we're living in a very different age when you and I went to school. And so again, you know, we've got even books and literature and magazines that, that young girls are reading and they think that this is the way to behave, that this is what boys want or this is the attention and, and, and um, you know, trying to talk to them about self-worth and self-respect and that no, set some boundaries. Nobody ever taught me about boundaries and it wasn't until after I went through um, my experience and was working actually for a DD service that one of the workers actually started speaking with me about boundaries and that was so imperative then for me to, to take that and develop the respect relationships program. And talking with young men to young boys, I mean there's such a confusion. Some boys you know, want to be chivalrous and want to sort of open doors and do these lovely things and then, then they're sort of not knowing if they don't have a great role model. You know, we've got a lot of broken families now. I mean, mine's one of them. So, you know, children, if they only have one gender of, of a role model, it's important to engage children with other role models of the opposite gender so they can, um, you know, grow up looking at positive role models and, and engaging with that and having a discussion with kids, I think, Really asking what do, what do you think is a healthy relationship? What do you what qualities do you do you want in someone that you start dating? And do you think there's a time when it might get dangerous? So when would you raise the red flag and you know come and talk to um, you know your best friend or maybe not mum, but it might be somebody else they trust? And 
really having that discussion with them because things have changed immensely. And um, you know, as a parent myself, I've got a, a preteen. Um, you know, I, I guess even I get nervous sometimes about what things I'm going to face. And we, we get concerned about um, sex, about drugs, about all those basics that, that have still been around since you know, 60s and 70s. But we've now got to handle a really violent society and also where the violence is basically, if I can use the word, tolerated because our justice system isn't that, it's a legal system, so it's not actually holding perpetrators accountable, it's not, it's, it's demonstrating that you can do that and get away with it. And so then if there's no repercussions for these children to see, that they're not actually seeing that that behaviour is bad and it's criminal and they will, you know, um, they will face repercussions for that. And Amy, how can schools help um, convey those healthy relationship messages and how can they support um, young people who are experiencing violence? Well, I mean, there's quite a few online resources. Um, I, I, I should have actually thrown them in the resource, sorry. Um, but, you know, they can look up respectful relationships and look up different, um, there was a Love Bites program, I've got my own program that I developed. Um, but actually just looking at resources, getting getting someone in to speak, um, you know, who's, who's doing respectful relationships and delivering that program. Um, I think it's a lot to rely on teachers to specifically deliver that Mary, I think when perhaps they may have had their own experience and not comfortable talking about it, um, they may not be really aware um, of what DV looks like and, and you know may not feel comfortable, have the time to plan a lesson around that. So getting a guest speaker in to deliver that and, and getting the kids to participate in the resources. So looking up some resources online, um, you know, it's even talking to the local police station to a DVLO, a domestic violence liaison officer and and asking them what sort of um, you know resources they've got as well, but online safety and about um, you know personal safety, um, because that all forms a part of it. You know, with with um, now with CV and dating relationships, we've got online bullying and cyberbullying as part of the stalking. So um, just really encouraging kids to talk to them and saying, look, you know, if you find that you're in a position where there's someone that you're with and, and they're not treating you right, or you, you're worried about your friends, you know, come and talk to someone or find someone you trust to talk to and. Just encouraging them to have, just have an open door. I say to schools, always have an open door, whether it be the teacher or the um, chaplain or the school counsellor, just keep an open door for those kids to come and talk to someone. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, I know, Carmel, I wanted to bring you back in because I'm aware that um, your organisation has just launched an app exactly on this issue. So I just wondered if you wanted to mention it and also, um, we were going to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit more about the language that we use and I'm we're sort of in the last few minutes, but Carmel, if you wanted to talk about the iMatter app and maybe something about language. Just waiting for Carmel to come back onto the... Uh, the uh, in um, yeah. uh, New South Wales Aurora and in Victoria Live Free, uh, the um, iMatter app is an interactive app which is kind of a virtual library of images and video clips and articles and quizzes and it was designed for young people and we consulted with a lot of young women uh, and it's really to encourage them to have positive conversations about relationships and to have a good sense of self-esteem so that they will understand boundaries, know when they're crossed, be able to um, know how to get out if they're um, being hurt in a relationship, um, not be mistaking um, what they see as loving and protective behaviour um, when it is in fact controlling and uh, moving towards abusive behaviour. So I'm at as, um, and that's what that app is about. And briefly about language, I think really um, if I had to make one point it would be about to, um, following on from the domestic violence cycle, it's about being aware of um, the mutual language that's often used in relation to uh, violence and um, when I was reading the paper last week there was a report of a murder that had been the result of a domestic dispute which is a ridiculous thing to say. Um, a dispute is a mutual thing and uh, should certainly not end in murder. Uh, and so all those examples uh, that Amy was giving like you know what, did, what do you think was your role in the violence for instance or how long have you had these kinds of marriage issues. Um, that sort of thing is very mutualising. Uh, so, um, I think that uh, what it does is it lets perpetrators off the hook. So uh, mutual acts entail consent. Nobody consents uh, to being a victim of abuse. Uh, 
even though they may be still there. They don't want the abuse to happen. And that's why the language of resistance is so important. And I think we um, often underestimate resistance. And we have more and more included that in our group programs and in our individual work with women, um, asking questions along the lines that Jack was, I guess, um, referring to. Uh, so that um, we kind of assume, if you like, that resistance will occur. And what it does is it's an indication of an inner strength. It's an indication of a, a capacity for resilience and tapping into that can help women um, realise that what they were doing, although they appeared powerless, they actually were standing up for themselves in some way. I don't, you know, we don't mind if it's spitting in the soup, really. It's some way of, I don't believe what you're saying about me. I'm not taking on that assault on my sense of myself. Uh, so I know we're um, running short of time, um, but if you follow on from the, um, you know, my first point, which is that recovery is about dignity. Dignity is at stake when there is violence. And uh, it is so linked to a sense of self and recovery is linked to a sense of self. So it's very central to us and it's our well-being, and it's also central to recovery. Um, the other thing is safety. I'd just like to make a point about safety. I noticed in the general chat a lot of people have been talking about that and uh, we probably haven't paid enough attention to it, but um, safety is absolutely crucial and this is one of the reasons why the whole um, issue of the family court um, placing children with people that uh, have um, been abusive, even if they are supposedly only abusive to um, the um, one parent, uh, it's very difficult for people to recover when they are not safe. You know, they do recover, but it's more slowly. They, the recovery is interrupted or um, uh, compromised, if you like. Uh, I don't think that we're very good at drawing the line as to when someone forces one forfeits their right for a relationship um, with a child because of their behaviour. Carmel, thanks so much. Is there just one more comment you'd like to make to finish? We're going to go a couple of minutes over because we started late, so I'll just if there's any final point that you would like to make. Um, I suppose what I'd uh, like to say is that um, I, I'm very gratified to see that there is such a you know an evident shift in terms of the community taking notice of this issue. Um, I think that we've come a long way in my career in terms of supporting women and different kinds of services and knowing how to be supporters. Uh, but where we've still got a long way to go is making perpetrators accountable. And I think that we're way, way behind on that. And uh, that's in a general sense in the community and it's in a specific sense in the courts. Thanks so much, Carmel. And um, I'd like to just invite Jack, if there was any final comments that you wanted to make. Thank you. I would just like to um, reiterate what Carmel said. And I think, you know, at the moment particularly, it seems in a political sense that domestic violence is being talked about a lot. And absolutely fantastic that Rosie Batty was given Australian of the Year. But when we drill down, there are still, you know, how the system actually operates there are still so many barriers that women and children face that we need to overcome. I think it's fantastic to have this conversation tonight and to look at the general chat and, and to hear so many people saying similar things. So I think, you know, in regards to social change, there's a lot more work to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. And now, Kelsey, I'd like to welcome you in to say a couple of things. And I know you had something specific around perpetrators. Yes, I, I, I said in the general chat because people have been saying why aren't we doing or trying to intervene with men and I think general practice in particular and drug and alcohol settings and mental health settings often see both partners and we're developing up um, an early intervention with perpetrators and I think that this is a direction that we're going globally where, you know, can we have conversations with men who use violence in relationships to try and turn that around because otherwise, you know, we're always working with the person that it, 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 you know, is on the end of it. Um, thanks so much, Kelsey. And I guess it's um, something that working in early intervention with young people that we're also keeping in mind, that um, people that might be troubled themselves may have grown up in environments where, where all of this was happening and um, helping them to, to become um, less likely to be perpetrated in the future is also something that I think we keep in mind as well as helping them to recover themselves. Um, yeah, so and Amy, I would like to invite you just to say a couple of final comments. 
sorry. I was just typing back to someone. Hi. Um, look, I'm just really, really feeling, um, oh, I've got my little dog here to come to visit. I'll pick him up so everyone can see. Because people mentioned pets before. And this is an RSPCA dog who went through abuse. So um, he's, he's our little baby. Um, I'm just really honoured to be a part of this panel tonight. And I know there's been, there has been a lot of questions out there in regards to men and men experiencing violence. And I certainly do. Um, I'm aware of that. I have worked um, with men who have been through DV and it has taken them some years to, to finally disclose. Um, my biggest concern going forward, I, I believe, is the children that we need to do more work to, um, to educate frontline services, but also to, um, to really ensure that the next generation, um, you know, have a big stance on this and that our judicial system's changed and that we have, you know, more workers going into the area of, um, psychology and social work, but with a DV framework and a DV interest so that we can help them. Um, I think definitely education and schools need, need to continue. Um, and again, you know, my biggest thing I guess tonight too would be the language just to help support women, just to, to ask them what is it that you need because for so many years or months, however long they've been in that relationship, no one's asked them about their needs and their wants um, and their needs haven't been met and, you know, unfortunately they haven't been able to think for themselves. You know, women are, are psychologically abused for the social um, isolation, psychological abuse happens before the physical abuse. So when they're worn down and they're, they're feeling weakened, it's very difficult for them to make decisions because, again, going back to the element of power and control that's exerted by the perpetrator, they're not able to make their own choices. And sometimes they look to the police to, to make the choice for them and, you know, take them to safety or take out an order. They look to a doctor to, to you know, to, to intervene and help them. So very often it, it, they're looking outside of, of the home for other people to make a decision and, and take them to safety. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you've got someone presenting in front of you and you suspect DV, just ask them, like uh, Kelsey said before, you know, how are things at home? You know, is there anything I can help you with? You know, what is it that you need right now? Um, and that I'm always hearing my doors open. And I think building that friendship, that trust, that relationship. I say friendship if you're a neighbour to someone. It might just not be someone you come across in your work, but there could be um, someone that lives next door to you. It might be someone that you work with. DV doesn't discriminate. There are lawyers and psychologists that go through this every day. So um, having an open door all the time and, and ensuring that um, I, someone mentioned on there before about services, Department of Community Services um, um, in, in, um, in each state government um, do up DV safety cars with um, local area um, numbers and also if you ring um, the um, you know, DV Connect in Queensland or the 1800 um, National Hotline which is in the resources that you should all get. Um, or even if you know your local um, police station, go and ask them for some DB safety cards and have them there for women um, to, to be able to take them if they're not willing to disclose. Maybe they'll just they'll just take them with them and have them in your workplace for, for your colleagues as well. I, I could talk all night, Mary. I'm going to be quiet no, now. That's right. Thank you so much. And look, I particularly appreciate your contributions in the general chat. So I've, I haven't actually been able to look at it myself, but I know you've been busy, <laughs> and I know that the participants really appreciate it. So we had up to 730 people on tonight and I just um, would like to take a couple of minutes to sum up. One thing I wanted to say was we haven't addressed, uh, well look, a lot of things that people raised we just could not as usual because it's such a full discussion and we can't fit more in. Um, but vicarious trauma is really important to remember. So if you're um, working with people in these situations as any kind of worker in human services or a lawyer, or a teacher, these can have a big personal impact on you. And I really encourage you to know that that's to be expected and um, it's not okay for it to really distress you and you need to seek support for that. But but it, I don't think any of us is immune to vic vicarious trauma because some of the stories we hear are so awful and we need to be human beings in order to be compassionate and responsive. That is going to have an effect on us. We do need to seek support for that. So please, um, I'd encourage you to seek support from colleagues. Um, so I just wanted to encourage you that if you would like to set up your own um, special interest network around this, the MHPM can support you to do that or you can inquire about um, joining an existing network, exploring family violence. Um, when you hang up tonight, you'll get an exit survey or before you hang up, we'd really encourage you to fill out the exit survey. MHPN makes decisions about future webinars um, based on the feedback from the exit surveys and, and other places. Please feel welcome to join in future MHPN webinars and also be aware of the library of existing webinars. 
all the resources from tonight, including the iMatter app link, are, will be available in the resource document. And um, our next webinar is Working Together to Manage Substance Use and um, Mental Health Issues, and that's later on in March. So um, once again, thank you all very much for your participation, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in another MHPN webinar. Good night, everyone. <laughs>